1 Peter chapter 2, verses 18 through 25. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 18 through 25. And we ask you be in prayer with us as we navigate through this passage this morning. 1 Peter chapter 2. 18 through 25, it reads, Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. For this is thankworthy, if a man for a conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your fault, ye shall take it patiently? But if when you do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable to God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was there guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on a tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. I want to encourage you this morning from this subject, suffering like the Savior. Suffering like the Savior. One of the interesting things about being a Christian, particularly when it comes to facing trouble, is not about how to escape trouble, but rather learning how to magnify God in and through the trouble. See, trouble comes in all of our lives and in many ways. Job reminds us in Job chapter 14, verse 1, that man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. Suffering is an inescapable part of the Christian's life. Matter of fact, Jesus told his disciples on many occasions that he himself would suffer. The Apostle Paul's life was characterized by suffering. And since we are no better than Jesus or Paul, we must understand that as Christians, we also are going to suffer. Now, this does not mean that we should go out looking for trouble. God didn't call us to be troublemakers in the sense of going out and see what kind of trouble we can get into every day. Nor does it mean that in suffering, we are to be doormats. We're not a group of nice people organized for the sake of being nice. And we're not to allow folk to walk all over us and treat us any kind of way just because we're Christian. But neither are we to have a trouble mentality. That means always looking at every situation as an occasion of suffering and trouble. You know, there are some folk, that every time you see them, they always complain about something they're going through. they just, they just always in trouble and suffering. I, they, that's called a trouble mentality. But the admonitions and warnings we are given in Scripture concerning suffering are given to us so that we will not be surprised when trouble comes. They're also given to us so that we will know how to respond in times of suffering and trouble. The Apostle James encouraged us in James chapter 1 verse 2. That's James chapter 1 verse 2 by saying, count it all joy. My brother, when you fall into divers or different kinds or levels of temptations, knowing that the trying of your faith worketh patience. And then the Apostle Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 12, that's 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. In other words, don't be shocked when trouble comes your way. That's what the trial in the, is for. It's to test you. He says, but rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. In essence, you ain't in it by yourself, so rejoice. Well, in this text, Peter addresses believers who were slaves in the service of their masters. Now, 
the lot or condition of slaves during that time was not always a good one. Some masters were kind and some masters were very abusive. And actually throughout history, people have tried to use the scriptures to justify slavery as well as denounce it. And while we know of all the atrocities that came along with it, particularly concerning our ancestors, the Bible does not speak about slavery in a way of dealing with it as an institution, but it deals with the hearts of individuals who oversee the institutions. Consider Paul in his letter to Philemon concerning his slave Onesimus. You'll read in Philemon chapter 1, verse 16, that's Philemon chapter 1, verse 16. He says, listen, I, Philemon, he said, listen, I know that Onesimus is your slave, and he's running away from you. He said, but now I'm sending him back to you, and I need you to treat him not as a slave, but now treat him as a brother because he's your brother in Christ now. Jesus also admonished slaves to be obedient to their masters with the masters understanding that they too had a master that they must answer to one day, and that was God. Well, our situation is different from theirs in that we are not similarly situated. We, we live in a society where there are all kinds of avenues or means for a redress of grievances. There's no suggestion in Scripture that we should not use unlawful or lawful means to address legitimate grievances, and slavery is one of them, and so we ought to be addressing some issues based on the Word of God. But the hard fact, my brothers and sisters, is that we are often placed by God's divine providence in situations where we are called to suffer. Many times when we find ourselves in the kind of situation in which trouble and suffering is present, we tend to either rebel and don't want it to happen to us, or we want to quit being faithful. But Peter is talking to some people who don't have that option. They had to take what they were going through. Therefore, Peter instructs these believers on how to suffer. Now, the supreme example for the believer concerning any situation is Jesus Christ. He's our example in faith. He's our example in love. He's our example in how to be humble and, and humility. And he is our example in suffering. The text says here that Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example to follow in his footsteps. There are two key words here. And the first word is example. Here it gives a picture or a meaning as a faint outline to be traced over. And you all recall uh, uh, those uh, elementary school tablets when children were trying to learn how to write their, learn their numbers and their alphabets, and they had the, dot, the letter with the dotted lines, and they were supposed to trace over them because it was a cut a path, was cut out for them to do well. That's what this example is, is trying to describe, you know, is that you've got to follow what's been cut out for you already. That's kind of following he's talking about. And then the second word in the text that he uses here is follow. And this means to take the same road, don't deviate. For example, if I ask you all to follow me home today, and I head out, y'all say, okay, we're going to follow you home, pass, and I head out, and I go to Star Road, take a right, I go down and get to 18, take a left, I take 18 and I 20, take a left, get on I 20, and get to 55, take 55 south and go to Terry. I'm on the way home, and you're supposed to be following me, right? But when we left here and you got to Star Road and I turned right, you turned left on Star Road. You kept going straight, went to 49, crossed 49, went down uh, Mount Creek Road and White Road and came the back way to my house. You've not followed me, although you got to my house. And in like manner, if we try to advance the kingdom of God or do kingdom work in ways that he's not prescribed or cut out by the word of God, we may get some results but they will not be acceptable results to God because we didn't follow his pattern. God tells us how to finance kingdom work, which is through the giving of tithes, the Lord's tithes, and our free will offerings, not by assessment of dues or special fundraising programs. When it comes to evangelism, he wants us to go and make disciples and not just wait on folks to come and see if they want to join our church. We're not to sit around waiting for things or wishing for things to happen, but we're to be praying until something happens. Yes, my brothers and sisters, we must follow Christ's pattern in all things, especially when it comes to suffering. So what then is the pattern that Christ has outlined or cut out for us 
in regards to our suffering for him. Well, if you would follow Christ's example in suffering, you must, here's my first point, you must make sure, certain, that you're not guilty that's caused you to suffer. Make sure that you are not guilty. The first thing that we learn about Christ is that his suffering was not because of his own sins. Verse 22 of the text says, Who did no sin, neither was there any guile in his mouth, there was no sin in his life, nor was there sin in his language, okay? To the contrary, most of the suffering that we encounter is caused by us. It's because of something we've done or something we've not done. You know, we, we often uh, react very strongly by saying, when something happens, I ain't do nothing. You know? and, and that's good, and that's okay if it's true. And if it is, you're taking the same road that Jesus took and following his example. But in verse 20 of the text, Peter says, Peter says, in verse 20, he says, so what if you suffer for your own faults and take it patiently? Then there's no glory in that. Accept it and move on. But if you do well and suffer for it and accept it patiently, then it's acceptable to God. In other words, if you do well and hadn't done anything, but you're suffering, praise God for what you're going through. In other words, you are pleasing to God when you can patiently endure suffering, even though you're not guilty, but you praise God in the midst of your suffering. The only way we're able to do this is because we're motivated by our sense and our relationship with Jesus Christ. We are not suffering for Christ's sake when we are guilty of something. Peter says in uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 15, but let, let, not none of, let, let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer, or a busybody in other men's matters. Now, we need to consider what we call suffering for the Lord. <laughs> because some stuff we call suffering for the Lord is not so. Needing money for bills, when you squander what you had at the boat or some other self-indulgent pleasure, might cause some suffering. But that ain't Christian suffering. It's just a Christian who's suffering. <laughs> okay. Getting fired from a job because you're always late and are lazy is not Christian suffering. It's just a Christian suffering from something he did and he shouldn't have been doing. Having health issues because you ignore all the rules of health is not Christian suffering. It's just you're suffering as a Christian because you didn't follow the rule. See, when you, by your actions, are the primary cause of suffering, you can't call that suffering for the Lord. Not having friends to be able to, not having friends to talk to you because you always talk about all your friends ain't Christian suffering. <laughs> You're just a Christian who is suffering. Now, God will discipline you for your disobedience. And we have to distinguish the two whether or not we're, you know, because, see, listen, God, he's not in the business of trying to get his children back. You know, folks talking about, I got to get you back now. God is not in the business of trying to get his children back. God just get us on our backside. He will discipline us from time to time. And, and you can't blame God for stuff you did and suffer for because of your disobedience. That's on you, not him. But the text also says about Jesus, there was no guile in his mouth. Now, this means there was no deceit nor cunning words. He did not speak out of both sides of the mouth, nor did he try to use deception to get out of suffering and turn the tables on somebody else. How many of you have ever been in a situation when you knew you were wrong, but you tried to shift the blame to somebody else? When God was questioning Adam for his disobedience of eating the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that God had commanded them not to eat of, Adam tried to shift the blame to God by saying, Lord, the woman you gave me caused me to eat. As if to say, had you not given her to me, we wouldn't be in this mess. <laughs> See, when we suffer for the things we have done, just own up to it. Ask God to forgive you. Ask God for mercy. Get up. Go your way and sin no more. Make sure you're not guilty. Well, you got to do that. Then here's my second point. If we're going to follow Christ's example in suffering, we must commit a situation to the righteous judge. 
you got to commit your situation to the righteous judge. Verse 23 of the text says that when he was reviled, he reviled not. Again, when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges rightly. See, we don't have the power or resources to pay folk back. We don't have the power, I said, to get folk back. That, that is not what we do as believers. And as much as he could have done it and been justified in it, Christ didn't do it either. It says when he was reviled, he reviled not again. Now, to revile is to use sharp words or cutting words, vicious and untrue words against someone. But we're told in the text that Christ reviled not. He didn't do that. He didn't respond toward his accusers in the same way they responded to him. But he suffered the onslaught of vicious verbal attacks from his enemies. They called Jesus everything but a child of God. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 18, that's Matthew chapter 11, verse 18, uh, it says that John came neither eating nor drinking, and they said he had a devil. But the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and behold, they said, behold, a man gluttonous and a wine bibber and a friend of sinners. That's what they said about Jesus. In Mark chapter 2, they said he was a blasphemer because he claimed to be God because he forgave sins. In Matthew chapter 27, uh, verses 39 through 44, as Jesus hanging on the cross, the Bible says those that passed by him reviled, at, reviled him, wagging their heads at him saying, mm, 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 look at that. If you're the son of God, like you say, y'all, save yourself. Matter of fact, it said the chief priest mocked him also. He saved others. He can't save himself. If he is who he say he is, let him come down. Then we'll believe him. Even the two thieves who were on the cross, crucified beside Jesus, the Bible says, cast the same in, their, in his teeth. All of them reviled him, but as the old hymn said, he never said a mumbling word. Here's a question to consider. How, how can you hold back your tongue and not respond to folk who revile you? It's hard, y'all. I mean, it, it, I ain't gonna lie, it's It's hard. It takes prayer and discipline, but as Christians, we got to do it. How do I do it, Pastor? I'm glad you asked me that. Here's how you do it. The text says Christ committed himself to him that judges righteously. Here is the secret to non-retaliation. Commitment to God. That's it, commitment, commitment to God. See, to commit something to God means literally to hand it over to God and let him handle it. One of my favorite passages of scripture uh, that epitomizes how to turn something over the Lord is 2 Kings chapter 19. 2 Kings chapter 19. And in that text, beginning around verse 14 and following, uh, King Hezekiah receives a letter from Sennacherib. And Sennacherib is telling him he's going to come and wipe him out. He's threatening God's king and he's threatening God's people. But rather than Hezekiah, you know, say, well, I ain't going to take that from him. He ain't going to do nothing to me. Or get his troops together or try to get bad himself. The Bible says that Hezekiah took the letter to the temple, spread it out before the Lord, and said, Lord, look what you got in the mail today. I, I know it came to my address and it has my name on it, but the contents belong to you, God. And my brothers and sisters, when we learn to let God handle the concerns of our lives because they belong to him, we then will learn the secret of non-retaliation. And young people, y'all need to really learn this. The young folk get mad because somebody stepped on their shoe, called them out their name or something that they wasn't, posted something about them that was untrue, or, or they heard something that somebody supposed to have said about them, and they feel the need to confront the individual. Because as they say, I ain't going to let them punk me out like that. That's nonsense. It does not make you less of a person to walk away from foolishness. As a matter of fact, it shows who the fool really is when you walk away and leave the fool standing there. So everybody, are, are you tempted to strike back? Give it to the Lord. You want to retaliate? Give it to the Lord. You got to put it in the Lord's hand. You can't act ugly and give folk a piece of your mind. You got to give it to the Lord. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 11, that's Matthew 5, 11, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and shall say all manner of evil against you 
falsely for my name's sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Our response when we are reviled for the Lord's sake is to rejoice. Your retaliation doesn't help the situation, nor does it help your witness as a Christian. Oh, you, they, they pulled to be a Christian. Because it makes you look just like your accusers. And oftentimes when this is done, when you're trying to retaliate by what somebody did for you, you're more vicious to them than they were to you. Because you got to get one up on them. James tells us in James chapter 1, verse 20, that's James 1, 20, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. You can't act like the devil and profess to be a child of God. And it takes spiritual maturity to do things that please God. We will suffer. Just make sure you're not guilty. We will suffer. But commit your situation to the one who judges rightly. And then here's my last point. Remember that he died that we might live. See, when, when you remember that he died that we might live, then a lot of stuff that will bother you, it ain't going to bother you. The text says in verse 24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. God died or Christ died to bring us to God. Because verse 25 says, for we were his sheep gone astray, but now are ye returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your soul. What good might our suffering do for us? What benefit is there when we suffer the Lord? What do we get out of the deal? Well, here's what we get. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 to 12. That's 2 Timothy 2, 11 to 12. He said, here's a faithful saying. In other words, this is something you can bank on. If we be dead with him, we shall live with him. If we suffer, we're also going to reign with him. In essence, no cross, no crown. The songwriter proclaimed, must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone. There is a cross for me, the consecrated cross I'll bear till death shall set me free and then go home my crown to wear because there is a crown for me. I don't know about you, my brothers and sisters, but I've learned and I'm glad that I've learned how to suffer. I, I'm glad that I've learned how to handle my trials. I, I'm glad I've learned how to pray for my enemies. I'm glad I've learned how to forgive folk. I'm glad I've learned how to turn my problems over to the Lord. I'm glad I've learned how to follow the master. Do I get it right all the time? Hey Amen. I pulled the answer that. Y'all didn't pull the answer that for me. But you're right, I don't. But thank God he's still working on me. I, listen, I know I'm saved from the penalty of sin. That's my justification. And one day I'm going to be totally conformed to the image of God's son and I'll be saved from the presence of sin. That's going to be my glorification. But right now, you and I both being saved from the power of sin that's our sanctification. And you and I both are in this process until we die or until the Lord comes back. And part of that process, it, it, it includes trials, it includes tribulations, it includes suffering, it includes trouble in our lives. But I heard Jesus say the other day, in this world, you'll have tribulations, but be of good cheer. Because I have overcome the world. And he did so over 2,000 years ago. When he went to Calvary and died for the sins of the world, he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be made the righteous of God in Jesus Christ. He was hung up for my hang-ups. He suffered that we might be healed by his stripes that he bore for our sins. He was crucified on an old rugged cross, and he died that you and I might live. He died on that old rugged cross. He died to one soldier said, surely, surely, this must be the son of God. He, he died that you and I might be able to get to the father. But I'm glad. I said, I'm glad. I'm glad the story didn't stop there. They took him off that cross and they put him in a borrowed tomb where he stayed there for three days and nights. Uh, but early, I said early, 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 Sunday morning, 
Uh, he got out the grave uh, with all power in his hand. Uh, and because he got all power, there's nothing that comes against me that I can't handle. Because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Christ is our example of suffering. When you go through something, don't throw in the towel. Don't get mad at the folk. Just say, Lord, help me. Lord, you take care of my enemies for me. Lord, you deal with them folk over there. Because I, 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 I might say something that I don't need to say. I may use some non-Sunday school words, God. Proud of my tongue. It's not easy. But you got to make sure you're not guilty. You got to commit your situation to the one who judges rightly. And you got to remember that he died. To bring us to God. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for the fact that Christ is our example in all things. We pray now that you help us to follow his example when we're dealing with suffering. Bless your people. There's only you can do in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our departure chorus, and we're ready to go. As you go, forgive somebody. Someone needs forgiveness now. As the opportunity presents itself, share the love of Jesus Christ. Oh, share the love of Jesus Christ.